After a tumultuous morning and afternoon where it seemed like we had reached yet another dead end in regards to finding our missing friend Emma, we were greeted by an unexpected stroke of luck once we were presented with a flyer from Bar Wolf that was found in Kathy's locker. From that, we were able to get Dr. Samuel's number, and from following up with a few questions with him, we found that, well, he had made some untoward sexual advances towards Kathy the night of Christmas Eve, aka the night well, everything went down, and in turn, we were able to learn more about Kathy's sole friend in town, the local taco girl Loretta. And speak of the devil... After talking a bit with Loretta, she was a bit uncomfortable with speaking us to us at any length regarding Kathy on the street, supposedly with some fear of uh, being overheard by Father Barton. So instead, she has agreed to meet us, or at least call us, to set up a meeting to uh, discuss things further about Kathy. And it's with this particular phone call you want to make sure not to miss because this is what sets up the meeting. Coincidentally, at Bar Wolf. Seems like the prime hot spot in town when it comes to the nightlife. And as such, that is where we are going to be heading next. As you can imagine, what with Isabella being, you know, knocked out at this moment, the bar is a little bit less lively than normal, which is fine with us. We want to have an intimate conversation with Loretta here. As you can imagine, being, like I mentioned, the sole night spot in town, you know, any hip happening go getter would probably come here pretty much every night, much like Dr. James. And Loretta probably gets hit on fairly often, so the name Samuel doesn't really immediately ring a bell. But having mentioned that he is the head doctor at Grover Hospital, it's probably pretty obvious that he tried to flaunt that whenever he probably hits on the local uh, local ladies. And it's with that that Loretta definitely remembers him, and the fact that he was being a massive creep. Indeed, Loretta corroborates the story that we already heard from Dr. Samuel. Though there is still the greater question of why Loretta and Kathy kind of, I guess, connected on any level. We already know to some degree how, let's say, Emma and Isabella, you know, connected. There, there was the whole song, Eternity. Loretta, on the other hand... Well, it just seemed like she had something of a connection with poor Kathy. Just from talking to her a little bit, yeah, she found that both her and Kathy shared an overwhelming boredom with everything going on with Mazurna Falls. Now, as we already know, both Emma and Kathy were kind of a mystery to everybody in town. They, they gave off a very surface-level impression to most people, but it seemed like very few, very few people in town had an actual intimate knowledge of these people. Case in point, we already know that something was a bit off with Kathy. We, we've already gotten that impression throughout the course of the game. But Matthew still tries to hold by this idea that, you know, she was just the, the local preacher's daughter, just very kind and innocent, but Loretta does have a point here that, you know, she, she was just a normal girl with normal impulses that, you know, in a rebellious phase, she might want to act out on. The problem is that if your father is the local preacher, local head of the, you know, religion, 
he might be a, a little bit more strict than most, especially if, well, you're not actually a blood relation of his, that instead he wa- he, he took on the responsibility of raising you, what, like 12 to 14 years ago, or whatever he wanted to repeatedly say the pretty much day she died. And yeah, Kathy felt a whole lot of fear about, you know, getting into her, her father's disapproved eye, his his view. And yeah, she she Kathy finally revealed a whole lot to Loretta here about the stress of having to be being raised as the sole daughter in a religious family. Especially if she in turn wasn't really a religious person. The thing, though, is that it wasn't apparently just a a very surface level, you know, fear of a, a paternal repercussion of being found at the local bar. Kathy instead seemed to have an overwhelming terror of Father Barton. From the one instance where we find out here that Father Barton managed to stumble on Kathy being here at the local drinking hole, it wasn't just a, a little scared that, that Kathy felt. She was just overwhelmingly terrified by what she saw in Father Barton. And from then, it seemed like Kathy would no longer be showing up here at Bar Wolf, possibly fearing some further repercussion from Father Barton. Thing was, there was one night later on when Kathy did show up at the bar. And that night in question was Christmas Eve. Yeah, the night when everything went down, the night when all the real mystery seems to have started, yeah, Kathy made one last appearance around the bar. And 9 p.m. does kind of go together with what Mel had said. I think he had mentioned that he saw Emma either walking down or walking away from Cochlin's Peak at around 10 p.m. Maybe it was that Emma had run into Kathy coming down the mountain and instead, you know, went back up to get something at the church, maybe? It's a bit hard to say. But all we learned from this is that Kathy seemed to be in an almost zombie-like state as she was heading down the mountain. Sadly, Loretta is not willing to tell us what Kathy's last words were before she walked off into the night. So before we can continue our conversation, I wasn't really expecting a call. And what you know it, it's our friend Winona. Seems she had a bit more curiosity about what happened with Kathy as well, and she was going to she's going to go see Father Barton, I guess right now. Matthew, though, is too invested to finally to in regards to finally learning more about, you know, Kathy from a direct source, so he doesn't really pay this too much mind. Or at least not within a, a timely manner. Because the impression that we've gotten from Loretta here is that it it might be that Father Barton's not only a very overzealous person when it comes to religion, he might honestly be just a very dangerous person, period. Because that thing that Loretta was a bit unwilling to tell us initially about Kathy's last words... Well, she is more than willing to tell us now that I think she's gotten the impression that a friend of ours is now heading up to see that man in the middle of the night by herself. And what were Kathy's last words? My 
my father killed me. Clearly that doesn't make a lot of sense, considering that she was later found in the forest, you know, still alive. I mean, she did have those strangulation marks, but the impression that we've gotten from the doctors and everything was that she died of shock. But conceding the fact that we still don't know the source of the, you know, bruising on Kathy's neck, it does start to make a little bit more sense that those could have been caused by let's say, an abusive parent. And also, it does start to make a whole lot more sense that the sudden shock that Kathy had once Father Barden entered into the, the hospital room that day and caused her to, to suddenly die was not from a memory of the bear, but instead just Father Barden himself. With that, we pretty much have to cut our conversation with Loretta a little bit short though I think we got a pretty good picture of something else super concerning about what's going on in town. And without much more delay, we need, we need to head up to that church as quickly as possible, because I feel like Winona is in a whole lot of danger. as you can imagine, there's not a whole lot of traffic heading up Cochlands Peak this late at night. And it seems like they are not holding any nighttime services. I mean, even the nun that's normally by the door is not even here. Question is, where is Winona? Or where is Father Barton, for that matter? I mean, at this point, we really haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to go exploring around the church, so you can get a bit turned around and lost. But for the most part, where we need to go is actually pretty straightforward. It's just through this door here. Because inside we find a mostly Spartan bedroom with a very obvious and very obvious and oversized envelope here on the desk. Envelope in question, as Matthew noticed, already was open with the letter inside, you know, being open to us to read. And it's dated Christmas Eve from Kathy herself. So if we needed some any stronger indication about what was going on in Kathy's mind the night of her, well, I guess traumatic death? Guess we need to look no further than this letter. Now, what I seem to piece together from this letter is that it is almost on par with the suicide note. Pretty much, Kathy had lived a, lived a pretty emotionally scarred life where she felt, you know, trapped and... Yeah, a lot of that was centered around Father Barton, who, for some reason, this very that very Christmas Eve, decided to strangle her and almost kill her, which, I mean, she was already living in fear of the man, but this just confused her even more so, and there was just this inescapable image in her mind of this, the face of her father just wanting her dead. And it was with the idea that she could never escape this mental scarring of the, this image burned into her mind that she finally was just willing to give up on life and go with Emma into the forest to do whatever Emma was wanting. I mean, if it was the death ritual and there was a possibility of immortality, she honestly didn't seem to care. She was more than willing to die at this point. 
because she honestly could not picture anything worse than that, that face of her father just looking at her with such scorn. Yeah, pretty, pretty emotional there. Though being wrapped up in all that manage, means that we were easily taken by surprise by Father Barton. Now, up to this point, we've definitely had some worries about Father Barton. He's, um, as we've seen, he's very much sinners need to be punished. He's very much fire and brimstone when it comes to the Bible. And it seems even more so that certain ideologies, such as, uh, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child, he, he was very much into that doctrine of. The thing is, it's a bit hard to measure because there were times when he seemed very genial, very nice to people, willing to turn the other cheek, especially like in the case of that uh, that fight outside the bar. Just what what would make a man so torn, just suddenly turn so abruptly on his adopted daughter? Well, plain and simple, in his mind, she was just taken over by sin. Taken over by the sin of puberty, the sin of growing up. In this case, the, the, the sin he had found out about her taking the those hallucinogenic drugs, going out to the bars at night, hanging out with loose taco women. It, it, it's just too much for him. can only imagine, too, that if you had stumbled across your, your child doing a whole lot of hallucinogens in a seedy apartment room with the local ruffian and just another girl, it, it could lead you to have a whole lot of questions. But it already seemed like Father Barton was not in a very, I guess, stable state of mind. Especially when it seems like he is... I guess fairly certain that while well, he could forgive, you know, Kathy or Emma or even Mel with with their deeds, the question is, could could God forgive them? And while for the most part it is really up to priests to, to only kind of give their viewpoints on, I, I guess, the religious texts or religious viewpoints. Father Barton instead kind of takes it a different direction. He seems to be thinking that he is getting direct messages from God. Especially when it comes to the fact that, while he would have been up for getting a confession, he was of the mindset that Kathy was already taking up with the devil. And that there was just no coming back from that in Father Barton's mind. And there, there was definitely some impressions of that. Well, not so much that he, she had becoming, she had become like the, the bride of Satan or anything, but that there was a, a weird ideology passed down from father to adopted daughter where. Certain things, certain innocent things, might have been almost diabolic or satanic. In this case, there was the mention that uh, Kathy wanted to join that, that, you know, seasonal party at the start of December, and that she wanted to do it as a form of rebellion against her father, because he said, oh, it's a worship of the moon, and that's super satanic, so she was whittling to do that. But in that rebellion... It kind of seemed like she was maybe pressing Father Barton's buttons a bit too much. And also Matthew here... Almost seems like he's doing the same. I 
know Matthew is trying to get across the ideas to, to Father Barton here, the things he's done wrong, but... I think when you're strapped to a chair and you have a mentally unstable person with a gun to your head, you, you, you probably want to placate them as best you can, especially when you know they're already a little violent. Seems, though, that you know, Father Barton, for all of his anger, just could not bring himself to, to killing his daughter. And in turn, that, that makes me think that he probably didn't do anything to Emma. I mean, Matthew does question whether or not, you know, since Emma and Kathy were together, you know, Christmas Eve, that, you know, maybe Father Barton did something to both of them. But I, I don't really feel like Father Barton might have done that. Also, he does cover a bit here where the rules and commandments, you know, that are, are kind of taught through religion are fine, but... There's just no escaping the fact that human beings are, are very emotional creatures. They have a consciousness. They have a free will. We're not, you know, based on our... We're, we're not fueled by our base or emotions. But, you know, you, you kind of have to have some level of morality. Though there, there has to be a limit to that. And Father Barton's mind had had reached that limit. And, unexpectedly, we get our second suicide for today. And a whole lot of, I guess, questions answered. About the unstable, you know life that Kathy had at home, why she would have wanted to be so rebellious and, and lash out and I guess the seemingly random ways that she did. And with a little bit of wiggling, Matthew does manage to get himself free because I don't know about you, I I don't want to be in a in the room with the the dead priest body. And while this room is fairly unfamiliar to us, I can pretty much tell you right off the bat that that door is locked. And while Father Barnes' body might have the key on it, I don't want to go searching on it. So instead, we're going to use this small movable box to get to a little hatch in the ceiling that is not immediately evident. And it's from there that we find ourselves in a little storage room inside the church itself. And honestly, I, I almost forgot that the reason we came rushing up here was because of our worry about Winona. As it turns out, Winona was a little bit slower than us getting up the uh, Cochlands Peak, which is kind of understandable since she doesn't have a car. And while there is something darkly comedic about her, her lateness to the party here, yeah, it's a pretty depressing scene that I'm glad Winona managed to miss. But yeah, things are slowly, steadily, darkly starting to come together now, at least in regards to what happened with Kathy, why she died, 
why she had those strangulation marks, almost why she was willing to indulge in super dangerous hallucinogenics and go out to the middle of woods with a another possibly emotionally unstable young girl. And it's uh, it's incredibly dark, especially. I mean, the entire game has been pretty dark so far. There's been a a few kind of humorous moments here and there, a few light moments, but yeah, Mazerna Falls is not a town to be trifled with, I suppose. And suicides, almost statutory rape, illicit drug trades leading to... I almost want to say like a, a white slavery trade, almost with Isabella, where she's kind of used as a a sexual object to lure people into the drug trade. Just a, a whole lot of horrible stuff going on in town. I mean, I, I will say at least the, the silver lining with learning about Father Barton's uh, dysfunctional relationship with Kathy, I, I guess it's good that it kind of exonerates him from any wrongdoing in regards to Emma or what's going on with her and it's just I don't know just a deeply depressing way for for that family story to end because I mean at this point you know there were, there's just pretty much father Barton and Kathy and their their existence uh, has kind of been wiped from from the map and their standing in town has obviously been super super sullied Still, the main question is, what what was Emma and Kathy's inevitable plan in the forest? I mean, they had secured some drugs, and they both seemed like they had no real reason to live or, you know, anything to lose at that point. They, it seems weird they would just want to go out into the, the woods in the middle of the night to do some hallucinogens. It seems like they, they already had a nice viable motel room to do that. Still, like I mentioned previously, I don't really feel like Father Barton might have followed them out to the woods after he attempted to strangle Kathy. It seems more, you know, Kathy got strangled up here, Kathy and Emma had, had met up down at the forest, they tried to do something down there, you know, the, the bear criminal mastermind that is that it is swooped in managed to probably attack Kathy, scare off Emma and yeah that, that seems somewhat plausible I guess if anything though uh, Winona's father is obviously very worried about his daughter having almost been probably shot by Father Barton I can't really imagine what could have happened if Winona did come up here before us. And likewise, Morgan thinks it probably might be for the best if we call it a night as well. The thing is, I really just can't get it out of my mind that there has to be something more that we've missed in the forest. I mean, there was there was the cave painting, there was the big tree with the, where, you know, Kathy's body was found. It really makes me think there has to be something more to that big tree. And I seem to recall that Cohen, the, the pseudo-forest ranger, it mentioned how everything seemed like it was almost set up like a like a ritual there at that tree. So it seems like he might be a good avenue to follow up on and try to get some additional information. And I can already tell there's a, a light up there on the second floor, so he at least should still be awake. thing is, it's a bit hard to tell. There there does seem to be something a little bit off with Cohen. 
Maybe he's just feeling a, a little bit under the weather. Or maybe it's the fact that he's a forest warlock that has a direct connection to the forest at large, and something is off about this night. That's silly, though. He's just feeling a little bit uneasy about that big tree that... Something almost ritualistic happened a couple nights ago where a catastrophic event that propelled the town into its darkest secrets coming to light. It's probably nothing. He should, he should just probably take a rest. And he definitely feels like we should not go look at that big tree. That it's, it's probably just nothing. So, considering, uh, I guess, his inability to, to be more direct with us, I don't think asking him about the big tree is, is really going to do us any good. So instead, it might be better just to let him get some rest and for us to make a, I guess, atmospheric journey back out into the forest. Good thing for me, at least, is that, you know, from that bear hunt we had earlier, I have a pretty good idea about how to get back out to that tree. And from taking a closer look at the scar mark, or the uh, scratch marks on the tree, it does kind of get some gears turning in old Matthew's head about that death journey ritual that... You know, we have kind of heard interspersed throughout the course of the game. I mean, we already got the impression that Emma seemed to have some ideas about it. There was also the fact that Cougar, who lived previously in the basement of the church, might have had some documents waiting there in the church that Kathy or even Father Barton might have gotten their hands on to get a better understanding of the ritual, and... It does start to make a whole lot more sense, especially from the existential questions we know that Emma was having about her life and, I guess, afterlife. That it does start to make sense that maybe this uh, death journey ritual has a stronger connection to, to what exactly happened out here. But that additional knowledge, that kind of strikes me that we should follow up more with Cohen, but yeah, he's not answering, which is a bit strange. Even more strange is that he has left his door unlocked. Now, quite clearly, his car is still outside, and even more than that, as we engage the periphery here, we, we see there's a big, large, burning fire, so I don't think he left. Or if he, even if he has managed to leave, there, there's definitely someone still here inside the house. Now, we already kind of saw there was a lit room up here on the second floor that we could see from the outside. And this one is lit up. Though it is locked. Maybe we can use the balcony to get in from an outside, uh, outside door. And yeah, if there were any questions about where Cohen is...
And we need to get to him as quick as we possibly can, though the door being locked is definitely not in our favor. If only we had some tool or, or something to smash our way in. And you might be worried that you might have missed some important item over the course of the game, what with all the, the random stuff we've been finding or, or getting, such as the, the sheriff's badge, but good news for us is that there's this nice open toolbox here at the end of the balcony. Inside we find something pretty nice to smash some glass, which is a handy-dandy crowbar. Now, Matthew is a little bit more gentle about this than I probably would be. If it was me and there was someone in imminent danger, I would just, you know, smash the glass and throw caution to the wind. And while it seems like jimmying the door isn't working, it's not once, not twice, but thrice that you do have to, to give the door a little wiggle with the crowbar before it gives way. Good thing for us, though, is that it seems like Cohen is still alive, just unconscious. I was almost worried we were going to have some locked room murder to, to have to solve this late in the game. As it turns out, though, Cohen is just suffering from a little bit of exhaustion. Something has been keeping him up late at night as of late. Seems, though, that even if Samuel does say it's a bit of exhaustion, doesn't really seem like a, a good time for the young teenage detective to do his questioning. And I do honestly respect what Dr. Samuel has to say here, that, you know, that Cohen is a, is a bit of an older gentleman. What might seem like exhaustion could easily escalate into something worse than that, you know, if it's if it's allowed to run wild. So he does want to do a few tests, try to figure out where this exhaustion might be coming from, what might be keeping him up late at night, and, you know, Matthew can do his questioning later. It especially seems like it's not the best time, because, yeah, it's almost about 10 p.m. right now, and visiting hours are only up until 8, so... Yeah, we're not even allowed to, to stay up on the second floor right now. And, matter of fact, it's, it's already just a little past closing time for the, the hospital here. So if you have an emergency, you need to go maybe to Boulder. I don't know what the next town uh, close to Mazerna Falls is. Still, I think we've had a pretty successful day outside of all the suicides and shootings, so I don't know. Hopefully you will join me next day as we head into our penultimate day of the game to hopefully unravel this mystery further. <laughs> <laughs>